Thanks for coming to Points of View for Silence. My name is Jillian Kiley. I'm the Artistic Director of English Theatre here at Canada's National Arts Centre. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the talkback for this particular show. All the talkbacks for all the shows are great. Oh, this is Point of View. Different thing. It's a kind of pre-show thing. Some of you have seen the show, though, so you'll know more about what we're discussing. Uh, part of what Points of View is for is to give you a more full experience of the topic uh, that we talk about in the show and, uh, and so that you'll enjoy the show even more and come out of the National Arts Centre with even a more fulsome experience than you could have possibly believed <laughs> possible. Okay. I'll stop talking. So um, I'd like to introduce our guests today. Uh, next to me here is Kat McKinnon, Kat Joel, Kat, Catherine, Joelle K McKinnon. And uh, Catherine plays the role of Alexander Graham Bell's mother in the show. She, do she doesn't look old enough to be Alexander Graham Bell's mother here, but they do a good job with, <laughs> with makeup and costume. And this is Trina Davies, who is the playwright of the beautiful show. And uh, these two women are joining me now. I'm going to speak to Catherine first because Catherine is uh, going to go into those uh, costumes and makeup to get ready for the show. And uh, so we're going to have our talk with Catherine first. I'd also like to introduce our dear friend Carmel Cachero, who is, um, who is the ASL interpreter. Now, today we are uh, filming this for pod... For, we usually podcast uh, this um, event, but today we're filming it for podcasts as well for deaf, um, deaf and hard of hearing audiences. So we're really happy to do that and uh, continue our relationship with the deaf community who are wonderful in Ottawa. So, um, so please don't hesitate to raise your hand if you are having trouble hearing uh, and you can't read sign language. Um, Please let us know just in case there's, a, there's an issue and we don't know about it. And uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we, the National Arts Centre is situated on the traditional Algonquin territory and the Al traditional Algonquin lands, and we are grateful to do our work here. So let's start with a conversation with Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Hi, <laughs> Okay, great. Um, Catherine. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Catherine. Just, just a little quick rundown. So Catherine has worked with uh, theater companies all across um, um, the country, but she's uh, been very focused in Toronto. She's done uh, work with Soul Pepper, Rare Theater, Cahoots Theater, Theater Pass Mirai, Deaf West, and Anteus. I don't know that word, theater. And, uh, and also she's done quite a bit of work on television with Murdoch Mysteries and um, Widow's Web, Silent Hill, Kenny versus Sp uh, Spenny, some moving work in the Kenny versus Spenny show, and Fargo. She's the um, co-founder and festival director of the Toronto International Deaf Film and Arts Festival. <coughs> Pardon me. And she was awarded the Actra Woman of the Year of all the women in Actra. It's pretty good. Come on. The Actor Woman of the Award. If any of you have seen Christmas Carol, you know that this is the way to applaud for people from the deaf community. Um, okay, so uh, I'm just going to um, continue my conversation with Catherine, and then I'll give a bio for Trina when, when we get uh, to Trina. Okay, Cat, Cat, you grew up in PEI and didn't uh, learn ASL until you were 11. That's a long time to go without, without uh, that. Um, can you tell us what happened in your life that moved you, uh, you had to move away to go to ASL and how did that change your life? Well, I first learned sign language. Um, I didn't, until I learned it, I didn't feel like a complete deaf person. I, I wasn't sure about my identity. I knew I was deaf. But I couldn't figure out who I was. So at that time in PEI, this is in the 70s, uh, we weren't permitted to use sign language. Um, you know, there, are, there is some sign language used out east, but we weren't allowed at PEI. Nowadays it is better, but back in the 70s, it was very much an oral approach in, in the schooling system. When I learned sign language, I felt really more like a complete person. I, my social skills improved as well because I was able to communicate with others. Um, in my younger years at school, I was quite isolated. I couldn't communicate with my peers. And the more I learned sign, the, the, you know, the better it was. And I was able to experience both worlds because of it. 
Did your family learn sign as well? My mom can sign a little bit, uh, but most of my, the rest of my family did not. Um, everyone else is hearing. I'm the only deaf person. Actually, my grandfather was deaf. Um, my, sorry, my great-grandfather was deaf. Uh, so there was a few people that had that experience, but, you know, I grew up in a rural area and everyone spoke, uh, had to communicate using spoken, using spoken language. And you lip-read yourself now. Sorry. You, you lip-read? Yes, I can. Uh, yeah. I learned how to lip read at a very young age. Uh, really, that was the, the, you know, with my grandmother, um, the foundation that I was brought up in. It was, uh, you know, I was, they were, I was home every day. I had lessons and I was exposed to that education at a very young age and I had the support. So that was really key and it's for any young child to grow up in that environment uh, in, in order to thrive. And so what drew you to theater, coming from a rural community and going into that kind of school? I, I'm sure most of you have heard of Anne of Green Gables. Uh, I'm sure in PEI, of course. Uh, so, as a young girl, you know, I, I was uh, I would pretend to be different characters. I would I would play with my cousins, and we we would role play with each other. And very visual uh, theater is very visual. So, my first live theater experience, I was five. Um, I went to a show called Johnny. Bellina, and uh, so that show, they, they, they were signing on stage and I was quite fascinated and looking at the stage and at that day, you know, and that's when it happened, it, it, the theater bug hit me. Nice, nice. And uh, what was the experience like in the rehearsal room uh, in this piece where, um, and, and some of you may know, there's uh, deaf characters who are playing hearing characters and a hearing actor, sorry, deaf actors who are playing hearing characters and a deaf and a hearing actor who's playing a deaf character. So um, can you tell us what that uh, that experience was like in the rehearsal room? Well, the rehearsal process was very interesting uh, and fun as well. I'm just trying to understand the question. So with the deaf, sorry, just to clarify, um, do you mind repeating that? Okay, just repeat it again. Okay, so yeah. Uh, so what was the experience like in the rehearsal room in this particular piece where deaf actors, because I believe the girl who plays Berta is also uh, hard of hearing or deaf, is that correct? And she plays a hearing person. And we have Tara Rosling, who plays a deaf person. So uh, were you, w what was that like in that room where people had to share those experiences back and forth? Well, there were a lot of conversations that happened. Um, you know, sometimes a person who knows how, you know, a lived experience as a deaf person is different, but at some level there is some understanding that you have to have as far as communication is concerned. So as a hearing actor who doesn't have that lived experience, they have to know that eye contact is important and a very much being a deaf character is a visual uh, experience. So communication in a visual sense and to have that understanding, that's part of our world as a deaf person. Uh, as well as uh, attention getting devices, uh, you know, tapping, someone on the shoulder, stomping on the floor, using lights, to be aware of those general uh, rules and of behavior in the deaf community, uh, learning how cues work and in a visual way. For me, um, you know, I always watch visual cues, uh, whether an actor is standing up, that's a cue for me to, to do my thing, uh, or a certain light turns on, or how actors move on stage. We also have cue lights backstage that we use. Um, it's not that hard as, as soon as you, like, as long as you figure it out. But the most important thing is that we work together in order to be successful. You know, and it's great uh, with having hard of hearing and deaf actors and hearing actors working together and looking at the characters and how they portray that. And can, uh, did you use a deaf consultant? Because I know you've been a deaf consultant um, on the show. Did you use a deaf consultant uh, who was different from you uh, on this particular production? And it would be great to tell the audience how a deaf consultant is, uh, is put into use for a production like this because we used one um, recently ourselves and it was really a good experience to understand um, things like how to do cueing, how to do those things.
Well, for this one, the rehearsal was so tight. Uh, we only had about two weeks this time around. So the time to hire a deaf consultant in that short amount of time didn't seem plausible. Um, so we had two options. We could also use FaceTime. Technology is on our side here to have those discussions with others, um, with those, uh, with my friend in London, especially. I, I spoke with them, and also I also have a friend in California who I taught, who I conversed with to talk about lines and how we can modify certain things, asking questions that we might have, and then I would bring that to the rehearsal room. Um, after getting feedback. So asking the director for their permission as well as the playwright to see if this was appropriate and what the, the direction that we were moving was, was in line with their vision. So important again is communication with uh, the director and the playwright in order to do that. And uh, speaking now on a political level, um, that has come up. We've heard some negative reaction to Alexander Graham Bell from the deaf community. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, <laughs> to try to summarize this, what's happened in history, this is prior to the 1880s, um, around that time, they would hi hire deaf, deaf individuals to teach at the schools, to use sign language. This was all over the world. It was, it was very much the common approach for education. In 1880, there was a huge Congress, an international Congress in Italy, um, in Milan, and they had voted to only use the oral approach uh, in education and not use sign language at all. Alexander Graham Bell was part of that movement and advocated for a spoken-only approach to education. And finally, uh, the, in, in, again, the, uh, the International Congress of Education for Deaf and hard of hearing teachers, this was in 2010, this is quite recent, where they formally apologized to the deaf community for what had happened back in 1880. So that time throughout history, it had a huge effect on deaf children and their education, their communication skills, the, the lived experience of oppression. Um, so it was a, a domino effect from there. So finally, sign language has come back and recognized again in the recent past, uh, but it has been a struggle for the deaf community. Sign language is what's needed to learn and they need to include it in the education system again. Nice, thank you. Is that thank clear? You. Does yes, that make that's, sense? that's great, that's great. And so things have changed quite a bit uh, in that since Alexander Graham Bell's time, for sure. Um, yes, go ahead. And also to add, it's, the ironic part is that it's interesting because Alexander Graham Bell's mother was deaf and couldn't speak and used two-handed uh, British Sign Language to communicate. And so it's interesting that that shift happened and that he was such a, a big supporter of the oral method considering his family. But his dad was a speech guy, I guess he fell with that. <laughs> exactly, a strong supporter of speech. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what is the difference between British Sign Language and the two-handed alphabet that she uses in the play and ASL? Well, I did research on the language and BSL is, was used in Scotland as well. Um, in 1760s, 70s, they, they had started using BSL and at that time they would use the two-handed alphabet um, and this was very much in the UK and it's ASL is one-handed. I don't know if you, this is the alphabet in ASL, A, B, C, D, F, G, the whole alphabet there. In British Sign Language, this is the alphabet. H, G, H, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, like, et cetera. So there are some signs that are different as well. Uh, for example, this is a sign for name. And in BSL, this is the sign for name coming off the forehead. So there are some differences. Uh, I'm from Nova Scotia and the eastern part of Canada. And, uh, you know, back in the day, they, there were deaf teachers who came from Scotland to who came to Canada who taught sign language. And we have developed an, a different sign language called Maritime Sign Language, MSL. <laughs> so it's a mix of BSL and ASL that you'll, rec that you'll see in the eastern provinces of Canada. 
Um, when you, if you ever met any uh, deaf seniors from the community in the, that grew up at that time, you'll notice that their sign language is very much uh, strongly influenced from uh, the British sign language. And so I did that research to see what the sign language would look like for this play. Thanks, Kat. It's so amazing. It's so interesting to see. And there's a beautiful scene. Well, you'll see it today. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. The show is so beautiful. There's a beautiful scene where uh, she's speaking to Alexander Graham Bell, and she's quite emphatic. And I'd love to know what she's really saying that he covers up. Um, so, uh, so I'd love to know if you have any questions for Catherine. Anyone? Oh, hello. Yes, I was. Uh, I was involved in London. Anyone else? Hard to see. Yes? I noticed that Catherine is moving her... Sorry. <coughs> I noticed that Catherine is moving her lips, so is she mouthing the words as well as doing the signing? Well, this is how I communicate. Um, I grew up as an oral deaf person. So I actually learned spoken English first. That was my first language. And so one-on-one, -on -one, when I chat, um, I will you know, speak for myself, but with, with a great bigger audience, I do use an interpreter. On stage, it will be different. You'll see that my facial expression is very much um, straight-faced, and you'll see a difference there even. So it, it depends on the situation. Yeah, a really big difference. Uh, okay, any other questions? Okay, can you tell me one thing that I'd love to know about the character? Um, Alexander Graham Bell says that his mother became deaf gradually. She didn't learn like you did. What was her story? What happened to her? Well, I tried to do some research, uh, and I asked Trina as well, um, about the background of Eliza. There's so such little information about her background. Um, the, the, the Library of Congress website would be great because they have a lot of information on the Bell family, a lot of articles, but it's apparently she was completely profoundly deaf. And um, you know she would sit there and a lot of the, in church even, and not know what was happening. Um, after church was finished, she would have to ask her family members, what did they say in the sermon? Because so much of the information, so her sons would take on the responsibility of explaining that to her. So that tells me that she was profoundly deaf, it, that she didn't have any information accessible to her. But the exact age of where she lost her hearing is not clear. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure she was quite young, but that information is not out there. Thank you, Catherine. Go and get into your costume. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thanks, everybody. Um, so we're going to move on to the wonderful Trina Davies of Vancouver. Uh, and I'll just tell you a little bit about Trina. So Trina is a Vancouver-based playwright and um, has award-winning plays including Shatter, Multi-Use Dungeon, The Auction, and Bone, The Bone Bridge. And the Romeo Initiative, which is the one I know about, was a finalist for the Governor General's Award for Drama. And that was a big, uh, was big, big, big deal, big deal. Uh, she's had uh, plays performed in Canada, the United States, Germany, Italy, and India. Uh, and has participated in residencies at Stratford Festival, the Band Center, the Playwrights Theatre Center, and the Bella Vita Playwrights Retreat in Italy. Not a bad spot to hang out, writing books, writing stuff. Okay, so, Trina. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Trina. I've prepared some questions for you. Okay. Okay. So, you and I share a dear friend who is Iris Turcott. Yes. Yes. So, Iris died... Quite suddenly, I mean, she it was uh, she died of cancer, but she died quite quickly um, a couple of years ago, and it was a it was a profound shock. And many of the shows that you would have seen on stages here over the years have been, and not just uh, from Toronto, but, uh, productions that have happened from right across the country were influenced or inspired or even seeded by Iris Turcott. So tell us about your relationship with that dramaturg. Well, I, I, uh, you have to forgive me if I get a little emotional. This is still a little bit raw, even though it was two years ago. But um, Iris was uh, a mix of a, a mentor, a friend, a cheerleader, 
She was the person that I could call when I was doubtful about what I was working on or even something in my life, and we could have a frank discussion about it, and she would always put me into a direction that would lead me to where I needed to get to. Um, so she's been involved in most of the things that I've, I've worked on, um, but particularly this play was uh, initially her idea. So she was um, in play development at Cannes Stage in Toronto, and we were working on another play at that time, a play of mine called Waxworks, about the life of Madame Tussauds. And she called me out of the blue, and it was October, I was just remembering, in about 2006, so this is a while ago. And she said, oh, okay, 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 I, I, I want you to write a play about Alexander Graham Bell. I thought she was calling about whack works. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, why, why Alexander Graham? She goes, just do it. Just read the stuff. And just like, and she said, and, 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 I want you to include. So the reason she was obsessed with it is there was a moment um, when he was a child where he and his brothers taught the family dog to talk. So uh, they had apparently taught the terrier to say, how are you, Grandma? Um, by providing treats and sort of helping the dog adjust its jaw so it could make these sounds. And she was convinced that, because I'm, I work quite visually, that I could find a way to put that on stage. So <laughs> that was the challenge she set me at the time. Uh, and she was talking then about a potential commission, and I thought, okay, well, I'm working on other things, but I'll start to, all right, I'll start to look into that. So I did start to, to do reading. And you'll notice, if you have seen the play or if you're about to see the play, that that moment is not uh, dramatized on stage exactly. So uh, yeah, I guess I failed in that way. <laughs> um, yeah. So great to have her, and she will be she will be on our stage several times this year. She was also um, very important in uh, Between Breaths. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, how closely does your play resemble the true story? It's pretty close. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm a bit of a history nerd. A lot of my work is is historical or set in historical times. Um, so I have a reverence for history that, that I know some other writers don't have. I kind of have to talk myself into doing something that I know didn't happen. <laughs> if, but it has to happen sometimes. I, I always say I'm not a historian or a, or a biographer. I'm a dramatist. And a part of my responsibility is to make sure that I, ha I have a tight, strong, concise story. And so sometimes I have to thread things in that might not be 100% historically accurate. But I love the little pieces. There are many things that Mabel and Alec in the play say that they did say to each other. A lot of that I excerpted some of the letters between them so that they are saying their exact words. Um, that they said to each other, um, and that, that makes me happy. Most of the events uh, are well documented. They were an incredible couple as far as paper trail. Uh, it's, it's exhausting, the amount of paper and things that they left behind them. There was just, uh, they got really uh, used to documenting everything. Part of that was the trials. Uh, that they went through about the telephone is that, that so if they had any ideas or they're discussing anything and there's a lot of personal letters so there's just a lot of material um, so there's a couple of moments that are not true to their life uh, but for the most part it's it's pretty spot on nice nice um, so the play uh, shows us the the obstacles that this crazy inventor, speech therapist guy um, hit going through his life, and and certainly the larger obstacles that she had. Yeah. Did you have any major obstacles? <laughs> I think every play development process has obstacles, and that's part of part of the journey. Uh, as I said, the play started in two thousand and six. Uh, so it's been 12 years before it gets on the stage here in front of you uh, today. Um, it, it started with the idea of this commission while things changed, as they do, and there was no longer a play development department. There was no longer the possibility of a commission. So um, this play became a bit of a back burner project for a while. It's, I didn't drop it. I thought there was something in there. Um, and when I discovered Mabel, and Mabel is my way into the story, then I was very motivated to continue. So uh, trying to find 
uh, a home to find another theater or another group of artists that was interested in going on this journey. That was definitely one of the obstacles. Um, and then it was... Uh, getting the first draft done. Um, the first act is four years of their life. The second act is 40. I had an okay time with the first act. <laughs> but, but trying to come up with how I was going to get to where I knew I needed to get to in the second act, uh, there were times I was pulling my hair out and calling my friends who were actors and saying, I can't, I can't, 40 years, I just can't do it. So, uh yeah, internal struggles, external struggles, both. Yes. So one of the overwhelming themes in the show is, um, or recurring things that comes comes up that is like a theme, is when Mabel wants other people, or particularly Alexander, to hear her, to listen to her. Um, to So can you tell us what's the difference between communicating and understanding when it comes to the Bell's relationship? Yeah, one of the main things I wanted to dig into with this play is communication, um, particularly uh, communication between a, a couple throughout their life, but also between family members, friends, uh, everyone who touches our life. Um, and one of the main things, when I knew Mabel was my into the story, I also knew um, it was going to be inherently theatrical because, as Kat was saying, and I have to say it was such a gift to have Kat involved in this process. I was in London for the entire rehearsal process. I was in the room every single day. And we, uh, it was such a fantastic learning opportunity for absolutely everyone in that room. Um, she really, uh, she taught the other actors how to use the sign that they use in the show. She actually created um, the kind of hybrid language that they used in the show. It was absolutely astounding to have her uh, have her in that space. So, so there are many types of communication going on in this show. And one of the main things, because Mabel has to make eye contact uh, to to have to understand what is being said, uh, there are moments where I had to work it through, and we did this in rehearsal as well. It's like, when do people connect? So, and just because you're looking at each other, as we all know, doesn't mean that you're understanding or really listening to what the person is saying. Um, but when people turn away physically in this show, the question is, are they doing it intentionally? Are they shutting someone out of the conversation? Are they doing it for their own internal reasons and it's a, it's a conscious choice? Or are they doing it in an unthinking way so that they're just... They're turning out of the conversation or out of communicating with the other person um, because they're just not aware of the fact that they're not uh, communicating and not, and the other person can't understand them. The other thing I found interesting about communication, I was just thinking about this the last couple of days actually, is um, there are all types of communication in the show. So there is verbal communication, there's a lot of nonverbal communication, there are telegrams, there are letters. Uh, but the one thing that got cut was the telephone call. <laughs> so there was, there was uh, and actually quite a late draft, there was a, a telephone call, and it was, a, it was a joke that I loved a lot, and it got cut because it was just a joke I loved a lot. <laughs> it was based on something that really happened, which, is, uh, which was that when they were in Benvrea in Cape Breton, um, someone called the house during dinner time, and it was a... Um, a telephone solicitor. So, so uh, Alec answered it, got really angry, hung up the phone and said, I regret ever inventing this. <laughs> See, it's a good laugh, right? <laughs> but uh, ultimately, it didn't fit the moment of the show uh, and, and the way the staging happened, it didn't fit either. So I still love it, but I'll just hold it in my pocket. Uh, and uh, so there is no telephone call in the show, which I find interesting. Awesome. Uh, how could you say that uh, um, Mabel Bell was ahead of her time? She seemed to be in the end. How was that? Yeah, whenever I dig into, as I said, I do a lot of history plays, but I don't think there's any point in doing a story uh, about history unless there's some current relevance. So there has to be something modern about it. There has to be something that is continuing, something that's in human nature that we seem to be cycling through and doing again and again. And what struck me about Mabel and Alec is that um, 
in the latter part of their life, they had what we would consider, I think, a very modern partnership, a very modern type of relationship, so that where they were very supportive of each other's work. They had their independent lives, and then they had their points of intersection where they would support each other in, in, their, in their mutual goals. So it wasn't one person being there just to support and bolster the work of another, um, but it was a real partnership. And, and she also, when she did sort of discover this part of herself, and I think that was a journey for her as well. She, I think she really did begin her life trying to have what she called an ordinary or a normal life, mm -hmm. which for a person of her class, which was, we're talking, she was a member of the Boston Brahmin, which is basically aristocracy in uh, the US. Alec was nowhere near her level uh, as far as the class goes. But a normal, ordinary life for her would have been, she goes released into society, she makes a good match of someone who makes good money, she goes on, she has her own children, she raises them, and she uh, manages the social affairs of, of the family. Um, so I think she did set out to have that life, and I think she struggled a bit even in the beginning of her marriage because she was trying to create this. When she let go of that, it, her, her life just blossomed into this amazing thing, and she went in all these directions. She did her own scientific experiments. She, was, um, she established the public library in Bedeck. She helped women to be able to make money um, by giving them uh, sewing machines and, and setting up a craft cooperative. And then she would take them and go and sell them to her rich friends um, so that people in the area could get money. Um, and there's a beautiful, beautiful thing. If anyone's ever been to the Bedeck Museum, which I was lucky to spend some time in, and there's actually a, a joke at the end of the play that uh, is a verbatim joke from one of his notebooks that I found. I have a photo of it, and that's my another little piece of something that I love. Um, but there, on, on the wall, it says, a simple, free, and unconventional life. And I have that photo um, of that sign, and I kept it when I was writing this play, because that was her comment of what she thought an ideal life was in the latter part of her life. So she moved from wanting this very conventional life to going, oh, no, wait, there's something better. And it was better for them. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you uh, tell us now, we see, and it's in a lot of the publicity that's gone out, we see a sign that says, you are the girl for whom the telephone was yeah. invented. And that's an interesting curiosity because, of course, she's stone deaf and, and yeah. can't um, and can't use it. Yeah. So uh, can you tell us about why you focused on that? Well, I, I mean, there's this beautiful irony about that, of course, is that he created this device that he couldn't use with the two people he was closest to, which is his mother and his wife. Um, but I think for Alec, it was more of an intellectual curiosity than uh, that drove him to create this device than of any kind of practical intention, which I think is shown by some of the... <laughs> Some of the other things that he goes on, uh, he's just really interested in making things and seeing how things work and moving forward with that. Um, sorry, what's that? Can you just repeat? It's a question about the, the you are the girl for whom the oh, telephone yes, was good, thanks. That's where I was going next. So, so in Bedak, um, I said they were very kind to me at the museum there and uh, gave me ac private access to the archives and I had a white glove. I could touch Ale Alexander Graham Bell's clothing that they had go through his notebooks. One of the items that they have, which they do show to, to the public, is uh, a photo that sat on his desk for the entirety of his life. And it is a photo of Mabel. And on the back of it, in his handwriting, it says, uh, you are the, you are, this is the girl for whom the telephone was invented. And I thought, oh, there we go. So that's another little piece I took. And I'm like, that is going to be there. Uh, it's a really, it's funny, it stays, it's a, it's something that you'll see in the play to, you know, technically he invented it for her in order to get her hand in marriage. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but it's, I think there's something deeper yeah. than that. There's something deeper yeah. in that. And, and certainly her provocations to him forced him to do yeah. the full thing. Um, so the theme of isolation, and this is where mm -hmm. I like talking about the lighting and design in this show. Mm -hmm. the, the lighting and, and projection in this show is extraordinary. It's done by a, a woman named Beth Cates. And if you saw Vigilante, you saw her work uh, in that production as well. And uh, Beth is an extraordinary lighting designer. And um, you'll see all through the, the play uh, people in individual little lights 
uh, showing their isolation and the isolation of, you know, certainly um, Mabel in her deafness. But can yeah. you talk a little more about uh, what that isolation, uh, the resonance of that isolation in the show? Yeah, well, it, it's the, as I talked about before in communication, I really was looking for the points of connection and disconnection. So where are we individuals? Where are we connected to the people around us? What drives that internally, externally, all of those kinds of things? And then uh, we're... I mean, this is just a dream team as far as the cast goes, as far as the design team goes. Uh, Peter was amazing to work with. I was very lucky that he wanted to take this project on. Um, but And I told Beth this um, at, in London before we opened. I said that her addition of the lighting and of the projection, to me it added another poetic language to the entire show. Um, it was an, it was a, another full experience of that. And so I... I love seeing how that idea of connection and disconnection has been threaded into what that looks like visually. And it's interesting because there was a number of people who came to see the show last night who had seen it before, but in January. And that's one of the things that they noticed and that they noted very clearly. It's like they didn't notice that they were in their own lights. I didn't notice where they were in combined lights. And there was all sorts of things they said, they have symbolism and design aspects that they picked up on in the second viewing, which was very, it was a great thing to hear. You can always know with a Peter Hinton show that whatever you see has been thought about and thought about and thought about and chosen quite deliberately. So it's it's good. It's a, yeah. it's almost a game. If you go to see his work again and again, like the same production over and over again, it just reveals itself, reveals itself. There's nothing there with uh, not on purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, so you mentioned, hmm. <laughs> this is personal. This is a personal question. So you met your own partner on Silence, writing your love story. I did. And did <laughs> Silence influence this for you, or did the did your burgeoning love uh, story influence Silence? Uh, a, a bit of both. I mean, my partner is not involved in theater, so I didn't meet him like doing the show. But um, but because this was a twelve year process, <laughs> uh, I, along that way, I did meet my my partner. And uh, he was literally along for the ride on this sh on this show because he did come with me on my research trips. So he came with me into the museum in Bedeck. He took photos of everything for me. He he's a, a wildlife biologist and photographer. So he's like, all right, I'll take photos. What can I do <laughs> here? Um, so he visited those places. He discussed the kind of things I was discovering at the time. He also came with me to, I went to Boston uh, to look at approximately where uh, Mabel had lived in Cambridge. And I sort of tracked down where Alec's office would have been and the graveyard that she talks about in the show that she actually looked at. And he was along uh, with me on all of that. But uh, at, so Part of the experience of this relationship uh, and writing a play about a relationship is that I'm, I was also processing, okay, what does this look like long term? And when am I connecting and disconnecting from my partner? Um, so I became very aware of that as I was writing a play about it. And, and um, there is bits of, uh, of our relationship, not much. This isn't about me. This play is about something totally different. But um, there's certainly things I can relate to. There's a game we play with each other called What If?, and it's a, a way of stopping each other from going down a negative path. So you'll say, oh, well, what if this happens? And then the other person would pick it up and say, well, what if this other thing happened? And we would play that game for a few lines and then, and then realize that maybe it's not as bad as the other person thought or maybe there weren't terrible things that would happen, that there could be great things that happen out of that. And so that pattern of dialogue is in the play in a couple of places between Mabel and Alec. It's a really, um, I was speaking, I was meeting with Peter Hinton the other day and I had to tell him how convincing. It's hard to believe that Graham and Tara don't go out as a couple. <laughs> like it's very difficult to believe it because their connection and chemistry is so strong on stage. Um, it's very, but they're both, uh, I mean, they're not in a relationship no. at all. <laughs> no. But it's a very convincing, very convincing chemistry yeah. there. Uh, okay. Can I pass it to the house? Anybody have any questions for Trina? Yes. Hello. Is there a mic here? I think yep. there is, yeah. I'd like to congratulate uh, the, uh, the director of the English theater and the director of the play and the playwright and all the cast for the extraordinary efforts they're making to uh, provide an inclusive experience for people 
who have profound hearing loss. I wondered if any thought had been given to making it an even more inclusive experience for those of us who have profound vision loss mm -hmm. through audio description, which is used widely in the theater in uh, the States, London, and Sydney, Australia, and many other places, mm -hmm. but has not really become very popular here in Canada. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that note. And it's uh, it's something we are working towards. And uh, there are, uh, Andy, is that something you want to speak to? And uh, Andy is, I, Andy's on it. Andy's on it. <laughs> Hi. Um, Andy is our producer yep. and uh, acting managing director. It is something we're working on, but if What's a bit difficult right now when all the shows we're bringing in this year, our show is being brought and we haven't rehearsed them, that sometimes it's a matter of the time of bringing... There are very few people who do this professionally. It's still being developed in Canada and it is a real skill. So it's, try, it, it's a bit of a, it's a, a catch-up game right now. So people are trying to be trained to do this. Um, and, and I'm not sure how successful it will be this year. We were, we were able to do it with A Christmas Carol the past two years. And next year, when we're producing, we'll be able to roll it back in. We're, I'm going to see if maybe we can do it for a hockey sweater, but we're not sure. It's a matter of finding someone who can come in and, and, and um, be with the script and be, and because you have to be backstage. And um, it, yeah, it's, it's hard to explain, but it's, it's something we are working towards very much. So, like, I would hope that within next year or so, as much as we're able to say to people, here are the ESL performances, here are the audio described, and, and we want to build that further also to relax performances. But it is a matter of just catching up in Canada and, and getting people trained for this. Perhaps we could talk later because I've had a fair bit of experience as a theater consumer with AD. Great. And I, if I could say just a moment, I have experienced that with one of my productions in Vancouver. Uh, and it was it was really lovely because I wasn't aware of the process, so I got to learn a bit about how that would happen to make it accessible in that way too. And uh, it, I think it is coming, uh, and I am I'm especially happy to see that these changes are happening and that people are paying attention and that they're trying to make it for everybody, which it should be. But thanks very much. We are we're we're working towards it for sure. Uh, okay. Anybody else? Yes, hi. I just wonder if you work independently as a playwright or if you're associated with any particular theater company. And if you are not associated with any particular company, how hard is it to be a playwright in Canada and, and make your way independently? <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a big, that's an hour long discussion right there, I think. Um, there are, to my knowledge, there are no playwrights on staff at any theaters in Canada. That is not a, a relationship or a, an engagement situation that exists. Yeah, venued theaters, yeah. Okay. I mean, not, not in venued theaters, you're yeah. right. Yeah. But yeah. creation companies do. Yeah, creation companies who are working together collectively to, um, to develop their own work. But when you're going to, you're, you have your own project as a writer, then you're essentially most of the time trying to find like-minded artists who are interested in going on that journey with you. So is that a challenge? Absolutely. Um, so it, it, sometimes I find in my career it gets easier as I develop relationships with people um, who, and I find people who share my aesthetic, um, who are interested in going on those journeys as well. Uh, I'm very fortunate right now. This is the first time I have a commission right now with the London Grand for a play that I know is going up in two years. That is the first time I have ever had that <laughs> in 20 some years. So that's a great gift and I don't take it for granted. Um, so it, it is definitely challenging. Uh, what makes it worthwhile for me are experiences like this. Um, and, I, and I don't mean the podcast, I mean, I mean sharing the story with the audience. That's the reason I do it um, and the more people that get to experience the story, the more satisfying that is for me. Yeah. Great. Anyone else? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Where did you find the first group to help you develop it? The, this play in particular? This, this particular play. Well, this play, um, 
It ended up being commissioned by Theater Calgary in about 2014, and I still haven't written the first draft by that point, let me tell you. So I did it in 2014. So then we worked with a group in Calgary mostly, except for Peter Hinton came in as well as Iris. Uh, and we worked with some actors mostly from Calgary to do the first workshop, which is a, a situation that's about five days where we do readings and then I rewrite overnight and then we do it again the next day. Um, and then this was pretty fast because the next thing was that we were planning on, on uh, producing it at the Grand. So then it was about, mm. um, it was Peter was committed. He wanted to direct it and he had some ideas about who he thought would be a good uh, match for the piece and then we just went with that and as I said it's been a little bit of magic with this particular group of people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I think we have uh, we have time for one more question and then we're, we're done. Anybody? Oh, good, it's hard to see. Ah, okay, thanks. thanks. I'm just curious why you said that you have um, non-hearing actor playing a hearing part and a hearing actor playing a non-hearing part. Um, in a day and age where, like, if there's an Aboriginal part, you have an Aboriginal person playing it, why did you choose to do it that way? Well, that's not a question for me because I have limited... Uh, input. I have some input into casting, but it's not my decision. Um, it's a decision of the producing company. It's a decision of the director, and they will ask me for my opinion if I have one. Often, I don't know who they're speaking of if it's in the other side of the country, so I'll take their advice. What I understand about this process is that there was, a, uh, and again, I wasn't in it, so I'm just speaking to it, is that there was a concerted effort to uh, find an audition deaf and hard of hearing actors for, uh, for the production. Um, the challenge in Canada is that that system is, is not as supportive or developed as it is in the United States. So I have a friend who, um, who works with a, a, a deaf theater festival in Edmonton and I was discussing the show with him and he said, oh, yeah, you'd have a lot easier time finding actors in the United States because there are more of them. And so that, that part of that casting decision was they, they were trying to find people who were not, uh, who would have all of the aspects that were needed for that particular role. So it's the balancing act of trying to have that. There's definitely what we wanted with this show was to um, provide opportunities for people and to, and to create the best mix of people to put on that stage. Yeah, from what I understand, that's that was the reason why. And when they couldn't fill, um, immediate um, Tara um, Tara came in, who mm -hmm. is a, um, has worked with Peter quite a bit. And I think if you see the show, you might agree she's fantastic in the role. Uh, but that, um, but then just because there are two deaf people in the show, there are two deaf characters in the show. Peter insisted there will be two deaf actors in this show, mm -hmm. and I think um, I think it works out very well. But that was uh, that's the um, um, politic behind it, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and probably a successful one. Okay, thanks everybody. I have to wrap it up. It was really great to have you here. Thank you so much, Trina, and thank you for your beautiful play. <laughs> thanks everybody. Enjoy the show today.